Hi everyone. Some of you will be familiar with William Barclay, the Scottish Bible commentary. Uh, his sold millions, blessed millions of Christians over the last two generations since the 1950s. This is one of his lesser known books, The Apostles Creed for Every Man. And in this book, I was particularly struck by what Barclay had to say about the Holy Catholic Church, one of the phrases of the Apostles' Creed that is much less talked about than some of the other key teachings that are listed for us in the Apostles' Creed and the later creeds. The Holy Catholic Church and the Communion of Saints. Well, his chapter on that, this is rich with meaning for all of us, so I wanted to read a couple of pages of it for you. He's taking up the illustration of the body, which he thinks of as the master illustration, the, the richest of all the illustrations of what the Church of Jesus Christ should be and is, the body of Christ. And when he's talking about it, he makes the point first that this is not a, an original contribution of the Apostle Paul. This thought was already in the air of the Greek Empire and the Roman at the time that the Apostles were alive and thriving. The idea of a body, a body politic, was already out there. And Socrates had used it, and in the apostolic times, Livy, post-apostolic times, Livy and Marcus Aurelius, the emperor himself, had used this illustration of the body. But he wants to dwell upon what the body of Christ implies as to the unity of the church. So here's how Barclay goes about that. He says, unless there is unity, a body cannot exist. And unless there is unity, a church cannot exist. But this picture of the unity of the church tells us not only that unity is in itself a necessity for the life of the church, it also tells the kind of unity that it must be. It is unity, but it is not uniformity. The duty and the function and the appearance and the work of the members of the body are not the same. In fact, as Paul says, a body that was composed of one member would not be a body at all. Quintilian, the Roman orator, said exactly the same thing. He said, I would not that the body should be all eyes, lest the other members should lose their office. The unity is a unity in difference, Barclay says. Someone has illustrated it in this way. Suppose a group of people want to sing. They can do one of three things. They can all sing different tunes, and then the result will be merely an unpleasant noise. They can all agree to sing the same tune, and the result will be unison singing, which is better, but which is not the best. They can divide themselves into sopranos, contraltos, tenors, and basses, and those in each part can sing their own line of the harmony, and the result is best of all. This is what the unity of the church ought to be like. It ought to be very far from being a case of flat uniformity in which all differences are ruled out. It ought to be a unity in which all the differences are gathered into a larger harmony. There will always be those who will wish elaboration in worship and those who wish simplicity. There will always be those who are happy in a cathedral and those who are happy in a bare and austere little hall. There will always be those who are conservative in their theology and those who are liberal. There will always be those who are fundamentalist in their approach to scripture and those who are not. But Christian unity does not mean the obliteration of all differences. It means the harmonizing of all differences in a larger unity. It means concentration on the Christ who unites rather than on the systems and the theologies which divide. This much is true that a divided church has lost the right to be called a church. There are few congregations which have not had in them at one time or another people who are characteristically troublemakers and disturbers of the peace. There are few churches which have not at the same time been divided into parties and divisions. There have been few discussions on Christian unity which have not been obstructed by and sometimes destroyed by those who intolerantly insist that they and their communion alone have the right creed or the right ecclesiastical structure. When divisions such as these arise, we would do well to remember that as the New Testament sees it, there are few graver and more serious sins than destroying the unity of what ought to be the united body of the church. There are two kinds of tolerance. 
there's the tolerance of the man who is tolerant because he does not care, who is tolerant because he has no strong beliefs or principles, who is tolerant because he does not think the issue matters, who is tolerant because he's too mentally and spiritually lazy to take a stand on anything. For that kind of tolerance, the church can never have any use. But there is the tolerance which comes from the certainty that God fulfills himself in many ways, the tolerance which refuses to be arrogant enough to believe that any man has an exclusive grasp of the whole truth, the tolerance which is quite sure that a great many things on the circumference of the faith can be left fluid so long as the center, which is Christ, is right, the tolerance which cannot bring itself to believe that any ecclesiastical system is necessary for salvation, the tolerance which can say, as John Wesley did, is your heart as my heart? Then give me your hand. Those who have been and who are still responsible for the divisions within the church and within individual congregations have much to answer for. The church ought to be a united body, but the body which should be united is disintegrated into fragments. And since it is so, the weakness and the ineffectiveness of the church are as inevitable as they are tragic. So Barclay wrote this near the end of his life, toward the last decade of his life, and he had met by that time many Christians in his work. The, his commentaries had become used by all denominations, so Barclay knows what he's talking about when it comes to the useless divisions that render the, as he puts it, the, the work of the church ineffective and, and inevitable, really, as these divisions thrive, Christ, Christ's witness and the church's witness so to Christ are nullified to a large extent. I wanted to link to two videos we have done, one on the Apostles' Creed and another on Oscar, to Oscar Coleman's book, Unity and Diversity. So they are, they're on your screen. And next time, not discerning the Lord's body.